first of all, um, thank you so much to everyone who is joining us. We have so many people, so a couple of people that I know are on the chat, which is so exciting. Um, and a lot of people that I have yet to meet. So definitely looking forward to uh, connecting with some of you. So as um, more people join the, um, the session, I highly encourage you to utilize this chat as a form of communication with us and also obviously to connect with other people. Um, but it's gonna be really important during our session for you to do two things, very important. One, tell us where you're joining from. You know, we have a lot of people from so many different places. I'm joining from New York City and Renee, you're joining from? San Francisco. Ooh, other side, other side of the US, look a little bit far, you know? So we have so many people joining from Los Angeles. We have Portland in the house, Phoenix. Wow, San Francisco, another Bay Area, amazing. Berkeley, New York, of course, we're Latinos are all over the place. Leave it up to the Latinx people to go all over the place. We love to explore. Yes. Amazing. This is really awesome. I love to see so many different places. Um, so this is so great. Thank you all for doing that for me and sharing where you're joining from. So now the next thing that I'm going to ask you to do, and you don't have to do this right now, obviously, but as Renee is um, guiding us through so much value and a couple of slides that she'll be giving details into, I highly encourage you to tell us what you're getting from them. What are you, you can start right now by sharing, like, what are you looking to get out of this session? When you think of hacking your job search, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What are some questions you're already coming with? And we are happy to include those questions during the, the presentation that Renee will be giving to make sure that you can walk out with your questions answered and get the value that you need for your own way of learning how to hack your own job search. So highly recommend for you to drop those questions on the chat. And as Renee is guiding us through her presentation, I highly recommend also writing down any questions that come up to you at that moment because we're gonna use those questions to dive a little bit deeper in some areas and whatnot. But um, yeah, let's let's get started. So first of all, uh, my name is Eddie and I do two different things. So I'm the founder of Tu Leader, which is an organization focused on providing resources for youth in El Salvador to develop emotional intelligence, build leadership, and also trauma healing. And the second thing that I do is I work for a tech startup called Thank You, and we do personalized video for fundraising organizations. And kind of hard to explain, simplest way possible, think, you know, MailChimp, but we mainly form, the main form that we utilize is through video. So uh, that's uh, that's a little bit about me. And the way that I ended up here is a coworker of my mine told me about Tequeria and it's become my biggest obsession. So definitely thankful and excited to have such platform like this where we can connect with people from so many different backgrounds. But before I go into anything else, I just wanna welcome one of the most exciting people that I have met this, this probably this last two weeks. And the reason why I say that is because it's uh, someone that has a lot of value to share, first of all, not just for you, but a lot of things for me to learn as well. Uh, she's joining us from San Francisco, as she share. And Renee has been working at Google for what seems to be now six years? Yes. Six years, which is so exciting. And she's going to go a little bit deeper into um, how it is that she falls into this uh, role, into specifically sharing with you why she's the right person to be talking about hacking your job search. Um, she currently works as the people partner at Google, which to most of us would probably mean like no idea what that means, but that's okay because she will have the stage and she'll be sharing that with us. So without further ado, everyone just clap whatever you can do on the chat to welcome Renee for sharing this value with us. Welcome, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. So Renee Ramirez, uh, my pronouns are she and her. I'm American with Mexican and Native American roots. I'm a first generation university graduate, born and raised in Texas. And so there's two things that I really miss about Texas. Uh, the first one is the food because everything is double fried and dipped in butter and it's delicious. And the second thing is college football. So if anyone here is from Texas, I saw a few in the chat, let me know what your favorite restaurant is so that I can live vicariously through you. 
I have a bachelor uh, in psychology with a focus of cognitive science and certifications in organizational effectiveness from Cornell. And so I went straight into recruiting right after graduation, um, and I focused on creative and technical staffing in Dallas, Texas. And then I moved to San Francisco in 2014 to join Google with my dog, Lexi. I was hired to grow and build the data science function as a recruiter. And over time, this grew into a staffing leadership role where I was leading multiple global recruiting teams for six different technical functions. And so that was data science, product analytics, quantitative marketing, product operations, technical writing, and instructional design. And I've since transitioned into an executive advisory role in people operations. And so in this role, I'm working with leaders to help them manage things like organizational effectiveness. So if a VP gets 500 headcount, where in the world would we put it and why? Talent management. So think about how you would grow all of the people on your team. And this is all through a lens of DEI. Executive coaching is also part of my role. Um, I'm a facilitator for company-wide trainings on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's very important for me to focus my energy on building Latinx leadership and executive presence in tech. And so I've also founded the company's first Latinx mentorship program, which is called La Conexión. So I'm so happy to be here with you and really set the stage for day one with our summit theme of getting hired. And I took a poll on LinkedIn to understand what job seekers wanted to know. So the time that we have today is really an overview of those top themes. And I wanna take you through the entire life cycle of the job search. So starting with how, how do you even start looking for jobs all the way to the interview process and even into the offer stage. And you'll notice that there are sessions later today and tomorrow that double click into some of these hot topics as well. So jumping right in. I want to acknowledge the world that we're in today with COVID-19. And so everything that I say today is going to be through that lens. Our community has been disproportionately affected by this, and many of us are not working right now. And so my objective is to pull the curtain back today and share insight so that you quickly move to the top of the candidate pipeline. So quick tips for today. Even though the interview process, um, it's all remote now, that would make you think that it would move faster because we're not handling all of the logistics, but actually it's taking a lot longer. And the reason for this is because companies are trying to determine how do we scale onboarding and training for new people and make sure that it's effective. There's also a lot more applicants right now. So- Sorry to interrupt you. I apologize yeah, for that. Um, the slides, uh, can you sh press share on them? They are not showing. They're not showing? Okay, that is a problem. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. I thought we had that set up. So just for everyone else who is uh, currently listening, you are able to double click the new window you just see uh, pop up at the moment, double click that and it will maximize the video for you. So that way you can see the slides uh, showing on your screen. So great. I think everyone else can see them now and I can see them. Thank, well. Thank you so much. Lee. No, thanks Eddie. So this was my intro slide so I could show you Lexi. That was the main point of the slide to be honest. And then here was the agenda that I was talking about when I was taking that poll on LinkedIn so that you can all see what are those top themes that people want to know. And here, here I was. So I was talking about COVID and being disproportionately affected. And so um, because many of us are not working, my objective is to move you to the top of the pipeline and share some things that candidates don't know. So jumping into the quick tips of COVID. So even though the interview processes are all remote, you know, I was mentioning companies are trying to scale onboarding and that's slowing everything down. Plus there's a lot more applicants. So stay positive. Um, and be patient. Get creative with your recruiter. And what I mean by this is, if you're declined for a role, the first thing that you should do after that is really asking the recruiter which other roles are open in the company that have similar qualifications, because there's actually a lot of roles that have overlapping responsibilities, and one might actually be a better match for you. I see this more often than you would think as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about job titles too. 
getting creative with your resume is very important. And I don't know that many people do this. And what this means is you should actually tailor your resume for every interview that you're going into. So don't have a templated resume that you're taking around with you. You want to look at the job description and the role that you're applying for and read through that. And whatever attributes are directly applicable for you, make sure that that content is showing up on your resume. Show passion on the resume. So if you're passionate about a certain cause, if you're involved in associations, if you volunteer, show that extra effort on your resume because we're looking for people who are passionate about the work um, and not just motivated by money. And so we'll talk a little bit more about resumes too. And finally, um, just keep applying because it's a numbers game. So the more folks that you reach out to, the more responses you'll get. So searching online, when you're evaluating how to filter through different job postings, the first thing that I'm trying to do is really look at the data and see what it's telling us. So I wanna show you a few key inputs. So here's what the job market bears today. I looked on Glassdoor, these are the top three jobs. So front end engineer, Java developer, and data scientist. This is also inclusive of all functions. This wasn't just technical, a technical job search. So if we deep dive into those top three jobs, you'll see Google search trends since uh, tw uh, 2004. And what it shows us is that data science, that role really started spiking about five years ago. It's also a little bit of, of a newer term relative to the other two. And so what, before we hopped on today, what I did was I searched for data science roles in Dallas just to see what was out there. And the requirements, they varied and they varied greatly. And so this is why you see a spike in search trends. It's because companies are all using this title. And the, the requirements ranged from statistical methods and encoding in R and Python to deep ML and AI expertise, um, to data engineering with hands-on SQL, and even to web development and ETL engineering with building dashboards. That is a lot of things. And so you'll notice that as new technologies emerge, companies begin to adopt titles that they know are attractive to candidates. And so think instead about targeting companies instead of roles. Be open to a title that you wouldn't have targeted before. Even more importantly, if it gets you in the door with a company that you really want to be a part of. Because internal mobility is a huge retention strategy. And so especially in tech. It's very expensive to hire people, and it's more expensive to hire someone externally than to transfer someone internally and then train them up. So if you have your eyes set on a certain company, know that once you're in, you will be able to learn the institution and how to navigate through it. You will have opportunities to move around. So don't marry yourself to a job title. Um, I can give you some examples. So at Google, what we call a product manager at one of my previous companies was called um, an engagement manager. And like Eddie was saying, my title is a people partner, but if I wanted to look externally, I don't, I don't know what I would look for. What, what would that be? So especially during COVID, you wanna be flexible. So moving on to networking, I, I saw a few questions about this in the chat. So networking is key, and this is how you get the job. So people that you know need to know that you're job searching. Ask them if they know of any open roles where they work. Um, ask them to make introductions for you. Building relationships is a very crucial part of job searching, and I don't think that people are talking about this as much as they should. Leveraging LinkedIn is something you're all probably already doing. So let's talk about that. You want to connect with as many people as you can. You want to send personal messages, but you have to keep them concise. So think about, like, what is your elevator pitch? If you're in an elevator and you only have 60 seconds with someone to explain to them who you are and what you do, what does that look like? Because I will admit, I do not read every LinkedIn message that I receive. But if the message is short and to the point, it's, there's a higher likelihood of a review there. And so I know that it feels compelling to hi highlight all of your accomplishments and, and share this, but writing a short novel is not going to get you there. And think of this, this first reach out, as being really like your marketing collateral, right? So this is how someone is going to determine whether they reach out to you again or not and invite you in for an interview. We talked a little bit about showing your passion. And so this is what makes up your personal brand. What makes you different? 
you know, highlight those extracurriculars or people that have recommended you, or perhaps it's a side gig that sets you apart. And I also wanted to share, like for me, um, networking has presented every opportunity that I've had since 2009. So networking will yield far more positive results than applying online. And you want to add value. So when you're reaching out to meet someone, reach out with a very real intention of getting to know them and understanding what matters to them. So can you help to connect them with someone or can you offer your time in some way? Because then you can cash in those social chips later when you need them. And so see it more as a practice of a muscle that we just all need to flex regularly. Uh, so uh, I'm here on that point, which is really valuable on networking and the value of networking. And you mentioned something that uh, you, most of the, the connections or most of the jobs that you have had have been because of the, the power of networking. Uh, someone had asked a question that I think is very relevant to it. As you're looking for a full-time job, which, you know, your full-time job at that point is to find a job, um, how much of your time should be going to connecting with people and networking? I know that I can probably share the sen same sentiment as you. Most of my jobs have been because of networking. Um, so yeah. What would you share to that? How much of your time as in throughout your entire job searching strategy? Yeah. Um, if that, I, I would say probably 80%. I, I don't think that it's so much about applying online. You, you really have to start getting out there and meeting people. Thank you. Yep. So I firmly believe that as a job seeker, expectations are the root of all heartache. And so there's going to be two different types of recruiters that you deal with. You have an internal corporate recruiter, and then you have a third party staffing agency recruiter. And it's really important that you understand who you're working with because their timelines and their communication styles will be super different from one another. And this is a theme that we will continue to circle back throughout the session. So a corporate recruiter, um, they're aligned with the company's leadership team. They have ownership of the process and they usually facilitate the interview process end to end. Third party staffing, they don't have the same insight and control over the company's hiring process. They're usually brought in temporarily to fill a role that for some reason the company themselves cannot support and they can move very fast and oftentimes have, um, oftentimes have next day interview requests. And this is because the companies that they're hiring for, they usually give them just one or two windows of interview availability and then the pressure is on them to make it happen. So the benefit of working with third party staffing recruiters is that they, they typically operate with a sense of urgency. And so going back to expectations and heartache, if you feel like the timeline is um, too fast and you don't feel prepared, just say that. But if it were me, I would try to make it happen. And the reason why is because scheduling can be very, very hard. So leaders are interviewing in addition to doing their day job. And it's really challenging to align the schedules of four or five different leaders to create an interview panel. So once you have that confirmed interview date, do your best to keep it. And in my experience, I've seen the candidates who are most cooperative with the timeline move through the process the fastest. And so what if you're, you've connected with a recruiter, you sent your resume, but you're not hearing anything back? If the recruiter is not moving forward with you for a role, there is a reason. It is highly improbable that that recruiter is forgetting to get back to you. Because if you remember, like the job of a recruiter is to hire the best qualified person. And so if that is you, then you're moving forward. And this is an opportunity for you to ask them for feedback about what the hiring team is looking for. Because in recruiting, we have qualifications and then we have the nice to haves on top of it, what, what's even better. And hiring decisions are usually made on both. And so usually it's a, a very specific skill that someone else is bringing. And just also remember that recruiters are, are overwhelmed right now. And so don't shy away from reaching out to them and help them, you know, remind them that you're waiting on them. There's an AMA with recruiters later today. And then we also have another session tomorrow if you all have more questions. So when you're thinking about interview prep, I'm, in, I'm going to show you a little bit of the sausage making. So the first thing that you should do is ask the recruiters how to prepare. They know best. They can usually give you resources or provide some kind of guidance. Most companies employ something called structured interviewing. 
And so the benefits of structured interviewing include increased predictive validity, which is basically identifying the strongest job candidate. And it also reduces adverse impact. So that means it's making it more fair to diverse groups of candidates. And this has been well documented by academic research for the last 20 years. And I'm going to share all of this data with you. So the goal of structured interviewing is to eliminate hiring bias by putting each candidate through an identical interview process with the exact same interview questions. This helps us to develop a consistent standard by which candidates are evaluated, which also means you're eliminating that objective opinion. So why am I telling you this? You're not the interviewer, but think about it in the reverse. So when you think about these principles, it applies perfectly to the questions that you're asking companies when you're the interviewee and you're trying to suss out the company's vibes. And so you should definitely be asking questions to every person that interviews you. And I used to tell my candidates to ask each person they meet on that day the exact same questions and then evaluate you know, how, how those responses were different at the end of the day. So think about what your values are in a company. Is it the company's leadership style? Is it a question about their culture? Is it how are they gonna properly onboard you during COVID and keep you successful? What is important to you? And so keeping that list of structured questions will help you calibrate the responses that you get. And so it'll help you better discern what a good response for you looks like versus one that's a little bit more shaky. So why not use the same approach that interviewers are using with you? And you'll notice how quickly that right answer jumps out to you after a few interviews. So Laszlo Bach is one of the most famous heads of human resources ever. Part of this is that he led HR at Google, and he led a number of innovative practices that really captures what we call googly today. And so here's a formula that he put together for how to craft a resume. And you will see that it all anchors on impact. So I accomplished X as measured by Y by doing Z. What matters is the change that you drove with your work. What did you do? And then how did it change things? And another resume tip to consider is, you know, if someone is reading your resume, is it easy for them to determine how recently you've worked with a certain technology or scripting language, um, or even what your skill level is with it? Because if it's not, then consider adding more context. So let's talk about how you will walk out of the door doing better than everyone else in the pipeline. So before we move on to the next slide, I have a question for you that came from the chat. Someone had asked regarding um, including recreational activities or things that you're interested in. And I see, I've seen this before where someone's mm -hmm. resume was like really beautifully drafted, but um, it was a little bit overwhelming because there was a lot of information on it. And a lot of it was things that they were passionate about, which is things that I personally would love to know about the candidate. How do you feel about um, people including um, things that they're passionate about, things that, you know, volunteer work they've done or things like that into, um, onto their resume. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you want to show your passion. Don't, don't let it be the majority of your resume, right? Use your best judgment for that. Um, but you need to show that because it, it's what makes you human. It's what makes you different. Um, I remember that I forgot on my resume. I, I said, I love Halloween. It, it was like a list. And um, when I got on my first interview with Google, the person asked me, so how did you become the flip cup, cha the flip cup champion? Like, which was a drinking game in college. I've totally forgot that I had put that on that section. Um, but I mean, he was totally cool about it. But yes, you, you wanna show some personality. Thank you. Okay, so interviewers, they, they vet your breadth and your depth of knowledge. So during the interview, this is very important. You need to be a consultant. So act like it's not an interview. You've already got the job. They brought you in because there's a problem they're trying to solve. Getting into this mindset immediately gives you more confidence. So approach your interview more like a conversation and brainstorm rather than this back and forth Q and A. Um, work on the interview questions collaboratively, right? So act, act like that consultant and you're both trying to solve together. Explain your thought process. So think out loud. 
If you're pausing because you're considering different options, tell them what you're considering. Tell them about the assumptions that you're making with data, if it's a technical interview, so that they know, they understand how you're getting to the solution. And if you don't know something, just own it. And then say, here's what I would try to do to figure it out. So you all need to know that interviewers will ask you questions about a problem that they're also trying to solve today, or maybe something that stumped them in the past. So they don't need a golden answer. They just wanna know how you would approach it. And use them as a sounding board. Bounce ideas off of them as you go. And don't be afraid of going into the wrong direction. And so one secret I'll share with you is, so not showing your work and not walking the interviewer through your thought process is where the majority of candidates miss the mark. And so the more you engage them as a partner in your response, the more coaching that they will be inclined to give you. And also show them, if it's a technical interview, show them that you can communicate technical concepts to technical and non-technical folks alike, because that's important. You will be working on a cross-functional team. Ask a ton of clarifying questions. This is very important. So, you know, back in the day, Google was known for asking brain teasers and questions like, how many fire hydrants are in New York? And so what would you do if you asked someone that question and they immediately said 5,300 without telling you how they got there or asking any questions? You know, don't rush to an answer. Show that you are comfortable, that you can execute with ambiguity, and then start asking them to clarify anything that was unaddressed in, in parts of that problem. This is a kicker in tech. Interviewers, they will give you a problem, and then they deliberately leave out a piece of information just to see if you ask for it. So remember, there's not just one right answer. Don't over-index on getting to a solution. And this kind of goes back to that old saying of, it's not the destination, it's the journey. So let's talk about being Latinx in tech. So we're gonna say- Sorry to interrupt, because I this a little bit delayed on my end. Um, before we move on to the next one, I have a question for you regarding um, the interview process, and especially when you're meeting that company and you're sitting with them and interviewing with them. So something I always say to myself is, the hardest thing for me to do is to get the interview. If I get the interview, I got the job. That's always my thought process. And it may not necessarily be true. And some people may be like, wow, that's a lot of confidence. So, but that's something I do with myself to have confidence prior to even entering the interview room. So what would you share with everyone listening as to the hardest thing for you to do is just get that interview. What would you share is your thought process at that moment, which, you know, you obviously just got a piece of knowledge from it, um, just to act like you already have the job. Yes. I mean, that's exactly it. First of all, I love that you have that kind of confidence. Um, but that is exactly it. If you if you have been invited in for an interview at that point, it is your opportunity to lose. There's something they like about you. Right. And so we're going to talk in a moment about how you can really double down on that opportunity and, and make yourself unique. I love that confidence, though. So it's important to understand Latinx culture in the workplace. So I'm about to get real with some of you. So I was fortunate enough to be in a Google Meet session last week with Dolores Huerta. And a topic came up on, you know, how do you balance being grateful for the opportunity and advocating for yourself? And really the crux of this question is, you know, how do you balance humility and pride as a Latinx person and so how many of you feel a weird aversion sometimes about sharing your accomplishments with your family and friends, or some might call it bragging? You know, part of you feels like they should see the, these accomplishments, but then another part of you knows that you have a sense of responsibility to not become too proud of yourself. And so think about spending your life with this understanding, and then suddenly you're thrust into an interviewing environment where everyone seemingly brags about themselves, because isn't that the point of interviewing, to show how amazing you are? So I encourage you all to give some thought to this and examine if and how this might be showing up for you, because this isn't even just about interviewing, but when you get the job, when you're giving status updates and meetings, when you're going through a performance evaluation, who do you see getting recognized? Is it the quiet ones 
or is it the boastful ones? And so if you feel like this is showing up for you, try flexing the networking muscle. Get out there, make people aware of who you are and what you can do. And a related tip that I wanna share, it's really helpful in combating imposter syndrome, is you write down your top accomplishments and things that make you proud of who you are, and then try verbalizing that with a trusted friend because that helps you be more comfortable with being proud of yourself and it's also proven to boost confidence in interviews and so we could hold an entire session on cultural understanding but for the sake of time i will move us along so getting back to structured interviewing and those evergreen questions that you're going to ask every company being latinx in tech also means curiosity for how companies are approaching dei some candidates shy away from asking these questions because they don't wanna make interviewers uncomfortable or they don't know if the company is focused on DEI. But you know, recruiters wanna understand your motivation just like you want to understand the company's motivation. So this could be as simple as asking, how is the company approaching diversity, equity, and inclusion? It's an open-ended question, just like the ones that you've been asked all day. And come with your non-negotiables, like Eddie calls them, of what you want in a company. And you really need to see the opportunity here because let's say it's a startup or a smaller company and they haven't started looking at their business through the lens of DEI yet. What value could you add? Would it be something that you'd be interested in helping them with? Because you are all here today with the community. You clearly care about this. So make sure it's apparent on your resume and take your moment. Um, also, were you going to say something, Eddie? I was just going to, I was going to add that 100% is like being able to identify what it is that you can bring to the table. So what is the value that you bring to the company and being able to communicate that is a game changer because just to give you a little yeah. bit of insight, if any of you happen to interview with, um, with my company at Thankview, a uh, question that I will ask you is what is so unique that of you that you'll bring to our team because you're you're unique you're a unique human being you're adding value to our um our culture to our company or you're taking value away one or the other and i say that because some people unfortunately are takers and they're not aware of it yet so be able to identify how do i bring value to the table and being able to yep. communicate that during your interview yep and even if you have a job today, a, a question that I would encourage you to ask yourself is, um, am I adding value to the role or is the role adding value to me? Because if you're adding value to the role, it, it might be time for you to, to find a new challenge. Um, okay, so you also need to find a mentor as soon as you can. I'm going to digress for a moment. So going back to how important networking is, Mentors are a critical part of your path. So according to research from the Center for Talent Innovation, 85% of women and 81% of multicultural professionals need navigational support to figure out how to best succeed in the workplace, but they don't often receive it with the same regularity as men. In a Harvard Business School three-year research project, Career trajectories of underrepresented and white professionals at three major U.S. corporations were closely studied. And I want to read to you an, expert, an excerpt some, from this, so give me a second because this is important. Many of the high potential and underrepresented talent became discouraged when they failed to be fast-tracked early in their careers. They became de demotivated, especially when they saw their white colleagues receive stretch assignments and promotions, and as a result, their performance fell to a level that matched their modest rewards. But some of these underrepresented employees, those who eventually became executives, avoided that fate. So what kept them motivated and prepared to take advantage of opportunities that arrived belatedly? A common thread among them was their relationship with mentors. In a 2016 study done by Cornell, they were studying whether there was evidence that mentoring was effective at retaining and promoting employees. So not only did they find that, yes, that's effective, but they found that it was more effective than other programs that companies employ, like trainings or targeted hiring events. Um, they found that mentorship programs can boost the representation of Latinx employees into manager positions from 9% to 24%. So although I know I'm speaking a bit more to career growth here, 
Even while you're job searching, mentors can play a key role in boosting your confidence, helping you to prepare for interviews, and introducing you to other people that can get you in the door. To uh, borrow their confidence, as I like to think of, you know, it's like if you're still yeah. developing your own confidence, borrow theirs. Just remember that to me, a mentor is someone who is in life or has a job or has connections uh, that you want to access that you want to get to. So therefore yeah. be selective about who you allow to mentor you definitely. Um, and know that they're there to help you to cover your blind spots. Yep. So let's get back to what you should do after the interview has ended. Always say thank you to everyone. So sometimes the companies, they won't give you email addresses from the interview panel for privacy reasons, and that's okay. So send the recruiter your thank you emails individually, and then ask the recruiter to forward those along to each interviewer. You also want to personalize it. So did something come up in your conversation that you want to comment on, or, or maybe they actually stumped you, and then you figured it out right when you hung up? Um, I will say the candidates that thanked me always stood out. Going back to the theme of expectations, ask when you can expect to hear back. You might have been the first candidate that they've interviewed and they might have several more to meet in the coming weeks. So just ask where they are in their timeline. You might've gone through one or two rounds of interviews and you don't have an update yet. And you don't wanna bother the recruiter and be aggressive. So you wait and you wait. Now a recruiter should never go silent on you. And remember, they might actually be struggling with time management themselves as well. And so as a candidate, feel empowered to reach out and ask for an update. I remember when I was recruiting, I told every single candidate to email me and I gave them the AI. Because if I'm in um, meetings and interviews back to back all day, right when I get to my inbox, then I know that a candidate is waiting on me. And so remember, there's a line between being assertive which is having a confident personality like Eddie has when he goes into his interviews, you know, that it's someone that says like, I got this, that is assertive. And there's a difference between that and being aggressive, which is confrontational or pushy and being assertive will grab someone's attention. And so what if the recruiter doesn't have an update and that's why they haven't responded to you as a candidate explicitly ask them for the no update update. Let them know it's okay to reach out and, and say that they don't have the update because at least you know that they haven't forgotten about you. And the next step is something that they're also waiting on. And oftentimes receiving a formal response is actually outside of the recruiter's, hand, the recruiter's hands because they're at the mercy of the business as well. So let's assume you're in the final stages now and the conversation starts around compensation. Always negotiate. Always, always, because I will tell you, everybody is doing it. So if everyone else is asking for more money, why aren't you? So, you know, the worst that will happen is that they will say no. The offer would not be rescinded because you negotiate. And when, when we think about, you know, we hear about pay gaps, right, and things that happen. I mean, this is one of those things that can perpetuate that, right? Certain groups are asking for more money and other groups are not. So... Discussing salary expectations is always tricky because it's a very delicate dance. You're going to see two different philosophies from recruiters, and this is often the source of frustration for candidates because they don't know which approach their recruiter is taking. Some recruiters cut right to the chase before interviews even happen, and they talk about money because if your expectations are too high and I know that I can't accommodate it, then there's no need to waste time. And third-party recruiters will usually ask about salary up front because they're working with another company's predetermined budget and they need to move quickly. The other approach is holding on salary discussions until there's a determined mutual match between the hiring team and the candidate. And corporate recruiters usually fall on that side of the spectrum. Conversely, when candidates demand salary information up front, it's a flag for recruiters. So money is important, of course but you never wanna give the impression that that is your sole motivator. You know, recruiters are primarily looking for passion and somebody's genuine interest in joining the company. Also, what you negotiate can vary big time. So negotiations 
the components, it's highly contingent upon the company. There are candidates that try to negotiate every single facet of the offer, and that's cool. That's their prerogative. But, you know, some companies, they flex on vacation time. And then I've seen other companies that draw a hard line against it. Um, I've seen some companies offer sign-on bonuses, while other companies have never included that in the compensation package. So candidates need to understand that components are highly variable and try not to become frustrated with the lack of consistency there. Just know that you won't know if you don't ask. And so you and your recruiter have the same goal. During the offer negotiation, the recruiter, might, they might ask you if you have other offers or if you're interviewing elsewhere and you definitely want to tell them that because you want them to know that you're in demand. That shared goal is that you accept the offer. And so recruiters, they won't work against you or lowball you if that is your concern, because I will tell you, I always advocated on behalf of the candidate um, because those monetary limits, they're rarely in the recruiter's jurisdiction, right? The better that we can represent you in the negotiation, the better it is for both of us. And there's a salary negotiation uh, session later today too. I highly recommend for all of you to join that. Um, one little bit of insight, and maybe you have come across this uh, regarding um, negotiation when it comes to el dinero. You know, it's like especially in the Latinx community, you don't talk about money. You just don't. Do that. Um, we got money problems. Don't talk about it. Um, but one question that comes up, or that I, I, I think you know, it's important to address is especially now that remote jobs are becoming so popular. And let's say you're located in the middle of the country and you're getting a job in New York. How should you prepare yourself to know um, what type of salary should be should you be asking for, especially when your job might be located in an area where they might not be willing to pay that? I love that question. Thank you for asking. So. Um, Companies take the a compensation approach that companies take is really based on where the candidate is located. It's not based on where the offices are located. So they will look at a, where a candidate sits in the world and then they look at the cost of labor for the role that that candidate is doing. And there's um, so many structured algorithmic ways of com how companies come up with salary ranges, um, but it's usually based on where you're sitting and what what's being demanded in your area. Okay, so the, fi the final hiring decision, this is super nerve wracking for candidates. Facing rejections, despite feeling like you did really well in the interview is a hard pill to swallow. And so candidates need to know that there are so many other factors that can come into play um, that are outside of the candidate's performance in the interview. So there can be shifts in headcount and this can change daily. Think about COVID, how many companies slowed down hiring at COVID. Um, like I mentioned earlier, companies promote internal mobility as a means of retention. So moving employees around into different roles as a way to keep them challenged before they resign is something, something that companies across all industries do. This is actually the most common reason um, why headcount goes away when it's not about the candidate. And business priorities can shift. So the shift could cause some areas to slow down hiring so that other areas can pick up hiring. And this could be a new product investment or a competitive strategy of some sort. Um, either way, asking for feedback is key. And I know what many of you are thinking. You're saying, well, I've asked recruiters for feedback before and they won't tell me specifics, but still ask because there are times that recruiters cannot disclose the reasons behind the hiring decision, which may be company sensitive. And there are truly times where it's not you, it's me. And there's nothing worse as a recruiter than having to say goodbye to a wonderful candidate because of something that's outside of your control. So we have reached the end of the interview process. Let's recap some key takeaways. Networking is key. This is how you get the job, get a mentor network within the Latinx community. Keep in mind our cultural nuances and the benefits of having a community that understands and supports you. Don't be motivated completely by the job title. Having a specific job title does not guarantee to put you on the right track. Be a consultant in your interview and collaborate on your solutions. And I cannot beat this drum enough. Expectation is the root of all heartache when you are working with your recruiter. One of the biggest pain points for candidates during the job search 
is the misalignment of expectations between them and their recruiter. Everything from what the pre-screening stage looks like to the total length of time from first reach out to making a final decision, it varies. I've seen some companies turn an offer around in a few days of meeting someone and other companies it takes months. And so communication is key, holding each other accountable for following up. That's a way that you can overcome some of those headaches. And Really, the recruiter controls a huge portion of the candidate's experience, and the only way the recruiter is going to know what you are looking for and what you need is if you outright tell them. So don't shy away from reaching out and asking questions because the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And with that, muchas gracias. Um, Rework.withgoogle.com, this is where you will find tons of data, research, toolkits, for hiring, interviewing, bias busting, building effective teams. You can reach out to me on Twitter um, or on my personal re website, reneenesf.com. Thank you, Eddie, and thank you, Tequeria. Yeah, thank you so much, Renee. There was so much value to be shared. I know that we have reached our time. Some of you had uh, further questions, which if you're okay with, maybe we can give just like a couple more minutes quickly to just answer some of those questions. Um, that I know some people had and but everyone else I know that you're, you'll be going on to your next session totally okay with that as well um just one question that I I saw in the chat um some some people who are currently doing and utilizing this COVID time to um go through training camps like boot camps what advice do you have for them as they prepare themselves in finishing up this like boot camps and moving on to the job search Sure. And so I assume that they're trying to change the trajectory of their career. They're trying to go into something new. Correct. Um, I would recommend trying to do volunteer products or projects for other companies so that they can show some applicable work on the resume, offering their time and doing it for free, just so that they can show, they can demonstrate their understanding of the function and then have something to back it up to. Mm, wonderful. Um, yeah. So that is pretty much all i have i think we answered a lot of the questions in the chat and i do apologize if uh if we didn't get to your question it's you know it's it's a it's a good number of them and first of all thank you so much to everyone who joined and uh, participated in the chat i highly highly recommend for you to take advantage of everything that's to come today tomorrow and friday there is so much value that the career has put together and worked so hard to to deliver this summit to you. So take advantage of it and, and be intentional about um, the reason as to why you're here so that when you walk out of here on Friday, you can know that you were given exactly what you were looking for. So similar to what uh, Renee said, it, the, if I cannot address this hard enough, expectation. So what is your expectation for this, for this summit? So that way you know exactly what you're looking for. So thank you so much, Renee. Um, this was really wonderful. I learned so much from it. And thank you yeah. all. Feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I may not get back to you right away, but that's okay. I will get back to you as soon as I can. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to any new opportunities in which we can hear from Renee again to share some value with us. So have a great rest of the sessions. Thank you. I also just want to say that Black Lives Matter. Thank you. 100%. Thank you. Have a great day, y'all. Bye, everyone.